Hey guys, it's Brendan. Uh, I am so pleased to announce that Rodina 1.5 is out. I'm really excited. It's been a long time coming. Um, this update is about persistence. So it is the first time in Rodina where you can actually go to anywhere in the game, any interior, any you know ship flying around a planet and interact with them, and kill them, whatever, and then leave, go to the other side of the solar system, and then come back and everything is the way that you left it. And that's great. That involved a lot of uh, technical behind the scenes work. And you might be wondering if it was sort of necessary in the first place to do. And so I thought it might be kind of cool to do a in-depth post-mortem on this update and talk about the all the programming that was done and, and what went right and what went wrong. Um, so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do that right now. Um, if you're not interested in like, you know, programming engine details, then you have to watch this video. There's not going to be any gameplay information or hints about the future. I am going to do a update or a video, pardon me, about the next update um, after this. Uh, so Redina 1.6 or whatever is going to be about the inventory and player systems, and I'm really excited about it. Um, so I'm going to do that next. Maybe I'll do more videos too. I don't know. But... For right now, um, I want to talk about the persistence update. So let's get started. So as an overview, the really main feature of this update was about serialization. So serialization allows you to take data and to put it into sort of readable and writable formats that you can use later. This is something that every game engine should have. If you are writing a game engine, you should figure out how you serialize data really early. And I didn't. I never did that. Because <laughs> uh, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, so it was really good, again, to have this time where I was able to address some of these problems with the engine because uh, e even when I first started working on Rodina, I encountered problems with implementing certain features in the scripting system and being able to have it all be seamless, have the data be saving and loading safely every time. And, you know, it, it was, it was, it's been a long time coming. Persistence is part of that. Persistence is sort of the gameplay facing side that ties a lot of this stuff all together. Uh, and so, yeah, there were some things that went really well this update, and then there were a few things that were sort of failures, if you will. So um, let's talk about them. So the first success was serialization overall. The, the serialization scheme that I came up with, I think is really easy to work with. The serialization um, system that I used was informed a lot by uh, the experience that I had with the Lua interfaces uh, over over the past few years. So, you know, the fact that I didn't do it originally, you know, who knows, maybe it was a good thing. Maybe maybe what I've got now is better than what I would have had. So one thing that the serialized data is used for right now is for saving and loading. Uh, previously, when you saved or loaded the game, uh, it would actually read uh, directly to or from your save file. Uh, and that's fine, but for something like Persistence, you want to not save to a file, you want to save to memory. You want to save it and, and remember that those things existed. Uh, and so that's a perfect use for the serialization. Right now, uh, the way the system works is when you save the game, it writes all the data to the serialized uh, structure, and then as a secondary step, writes that structure to uh, to a file. Um, so that's great, and it works fine, and it's it's lovely, but the real benefit is that now we can do the persistence. So instead of saving directly to a file or saving to a data structure that saves to a file, now when you leave an interior, it'll save all of the data to the data structure, and then it'll just remember it. It'll it'll save it for later, so if you ever come back. That's a, a major benefit, um, and it's, it's the way that it always should have been. It feels good to fix things like that up. Um, which brings us to the, another thing that went right, which is the storage. Um, once we had the serialized data, it, it really was really nice. This is one of those cases in programming where things kind of work like magic, uh, where once you have a functioning save load with this intermediate structure, um, it becomes really sort of trivial to skip the step where you write it to a file and instead hold on to it. And um, then later, you know, it's, it's almost like you're loading a save game, but there's no file to load, and, and it worked really well. Right now, every object in the game has a persistence profile that determines when it gets saved, you know, when to throw it away. When you leave an interior, every object in the interior has the opportunity to, to say whether it should persist, and most of them don't because we want to keep the, the file size small. 
but things like pickups, uh, you know, power ups, and of course enemies that you're fighting, they'll all they'll all save. One interesting case for the the persistent stuff are ship groups. Right now, the way that ship groups work on the planets is the lead ship is the only one that exists all the time. So you, if you fly to a planet, you'll see little red dots flying around. Those are the lead ships from a particular group. And the other ships are only loaded in when you get close enough. But what happens if you get close enough, they all get created, and then you fly away, but the main ship also flies away, right? Because when you come back, that group is going to be leaderless. Really what you want is for everything to sort of stick around for a while but after a while everything gets reset back to the beginning and that's so that that was kind of a, that's a, i think a a good part of this persistence one other thing that i was really happy with this update were was the uh component refactor so part of the process of getting these uh gameplay features in getting them to be seamless and easily integrated is about making um, making the this, the engine's component system a little more robust, and so I really needed to move a, a lot of the features from the Lewis side into the component side. So uh, ship fires, um, room air pressure, things like that, more gameplay features. They're just too slow in scripting, and also moving them to the engine side allows me to have a little bit more tighter control over how things are saved and load. A little bit, it's a little bit easier. Uh, to make sure that things are safe and really what i've learned with with, um, with scripting is that uh, you know it's that old story of it, it makes scripting makes the beginning easier but eventually it becomes its own problem so hopefully this will allow me to um, work on more gameplay stuff uh, starting now in a, in a much more productive way so really really happy about that and it should be more performant as well so one last part of the update that went really well was uh, the concept of the seed id mapping it was hard to figure out what to do in the hypothetical situation where, you know, a player goes to an interior and then leaves, and then while they're gone, I update the game, or they install a mod, and they change the generated algorithm. In order for the stored data to make sense, the, the generated interior needs to match what you saw the first time you were there. Uh, in order for it to to work, it needs to, it needs to match up, and it might not match up because the whole point of this game is that I'm evolving it over time. You know what happens if you come back to a generated interior and that wing of the of the building doesn't exist anymore because I took the wings out in that update. What happens if you go back to an interior to a building and I've changed the theme so there's no there's new new guys there. You know that's going to happen all the time in, in these game updates. So what happens when you go back and the stored data is referring to things that don't exist anymore? Or, because here's the other possibility, maybe I updated the algorithm, but I only tweaked it a little. So maybe when you go back, only like one thing is different. What, what do we do in that case? So what I decided was to refer to all generated interior objects, generated anything in a generated space, to refer to it by its seed value as opposed to some arbitrary ID. And this is really great because um, the generation process automatically assigns seeds to these entities. And if you change the, the generator, it'll generate different seeds. Um, if you don't change a generator, it won't generate different seeds. It'll generate the same ones that you're used to, the same, same ones that you'd seen last time you were there. So what this is, is a mapping of, you take the seed values for all of the items in your interior map, and you you correspond them to the ID number of the eventual you know entity that was created for them, and keeping that data around is really helpful because what it does is it allows me to um, to later on when you're restoring these entities, you can say like oh the generator has been updated and this entity doesn't exist anymore so don't even bother restoring it, or you can say you know this item doesn't exist in the map but because we don't have a seed mapping for it we know that they were brought in from outside it's like if you take your um your grav bike and you park it in your ship you don't want later on your ship to say hey we don't recognize this grav bike you want it to know that we don't know anything about that so it looks to the seed value the seed mapping to 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 see if it if it knows about it um and that's really great because it means that if if you return to an interior and it's changed then we can deal with it. But if it's only changed a little bit, then we only deal with the part that's changed. And if it hasn't changed at all, you don't deal with that part at all. 
I was afraid we were going to have to just throw all this data away every time we uh, every time I updated the game, and it would really defeat the purpose of the of the persistence. The main feature of this update was that everything should stay forever, and and that really should have, should include updates to the game. So I'm really happy with how that turned out. Okay, unfortunately, not everything went well this update. Uh, there were two things that I had to give up on because they were taking too long, and this you know this update needed to get wrapped up. Um, the first was I really wanted to create a unified creation, like entity creation pathway. Um, right now, like a lot of the game, um, the way entities are created relies too much on the scripting system. Uh, and it doesn't play that well with the new serialization stuff or the old <laughs> save load stuff. And, uh, and it's just not good enough. I wanted it to be a little more data driven. The scripts should give the engine a little data package describing what the new entity is. Instead, what they do is they create the entity and then they mess with it a little bit in the scripting. And it, it's just not good enough, but it also wasn't a deal breaker. So um, I punted it and uh, it's just going to be a thorn in my side. Hopefully it won't affect the game too much. It will be something that I need to do before multiplayer. So um, it may be something that I end up addressing, but, um, but not right now. The other thing that didn't go well this update was I was intending on addressing uh, something that uh, doesn't matter to you all. It's the EGSL parser. So EGSL is a little um, hobby uh, programming language that um, a friend of mine and I had been working on for the game. Uh, and the idea behind EGSL is, was, and is to uh, make game simulation possible in uh, declarative programming language. I'm excited about that prospect, but most of the potential payoff for it is many years in the future. It has to do with AI and, you know, things like that. It's not necessary for this update, um, but it is a bummer because I, I really wanted to um, to work on it. So EGSL is already in the game right now. It's uh, it's what I use to generate the um, the interiors, the sort of the uh, the node tree of uh, of the interiors, and uh, and it works great. But the parser takes a long time to run, and so I needed to rewrite it, and just didn't have time. And um, the good thing about the EGSL stuff is that a lot of the benefit for it in the mean in the short term. Um, I can I can gain that benefit um, using methods that are a little more simple. So I'm going to do that in the meantime. But you know, in the long run, it would be nice to to revisit. But it's sort of a nice to have and not necessary. So I don't know if that was interesting or not. I just rambled a lot. I'm going to need to edit this video and see if it's horrible. That's kind of the a lot of the what was going on in this update. It's uh, it was a it was a real slog, and a lot of it was behind the scenes. A lot of the fights are things you guys are never going to see or hopefully ever know about. But, um, you know, all of these things are going to make it really, really, I mean, possible, never mind easy, to do the next update. The next update is going to be inventory systems, player systems, upgrades, and, you know, a lot more complexity. And the only way to do that was to have things like persistence and serialization. So... Uh, it was really good that I got an opportunity to work on this stuff, even though it's not the most exciting. And I am really, really excited to uh, to do another video. I think I'm going to share you know details about the next update too. So I'll do that next. So see you guys next time. Thank you for watching.